Well, good morning. Good to be with you this Sunday morning, and we are between series. I did finish the book of Ephesians a couple of weeks ago, and it was a great uh, experience for me to preach through it again. And uh, we've got some more coming, but we're having, uh, I mean, another series coming in the uh, near future. But in between, I'm going to teach a couple of Psalms, uh, Psalm 111, and then when Peter is here next week, there'll be a break. And then after Peter Lilbeck has preached, I'll preach another Psalm, 112, and then we'll begin a series on Elisha. But this morning, Psalm 111, what a great Psalm it is. Praise the Lord. That's a translation of hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. Notice this word forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are truth and justice. All His precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to His people. He has ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. A year ago, two of my grandchildren were reading Homer's Iliad for school. Uh, Not easy reading for that age, but uh, it got me thinking about it. It's considered one of the most significant books of Western civilization. It was Alexander the Great's Bible. He carried it with him, a copy of it with him, as he led his army across the world. It begins in the tenth year of the war between the Greeks and Trojans. It has heroic warriors, Achilles and Hector, Odysseus and Ajax, lots of battles described in gruesome detail, and more. Behind the scenes, the gods helped their favorite warriors. Some favored the Greeks, some favored the Trojans, and all tried to affect the outcome by plotting and fighting against each other. The gods are feckless. You see that as you read through it. But that's what makes the poem rather interesting and significant, I think. Or the, more, than, more than a poem, more than a war novel, it's really a window on the soul of ancient man who, who believed that there was more to reality than what is seen. There are gods who have influence over us. The gods, as I said, are feckless. They're they're no different from the people who worship them, showing how, how dark man's mind was. But really no darker than modern man, who believes reality is only in what is seen. How different both ancient pagans and modern materialists are from the, the righteous who have lived among them from the beginning and whose understanding of reality comes from the Hebrew Bible. Psalm 111 
is both revelation and the product of divine revelation, the product of natural or general revelation as the psalmist looked around and saw all that was revealed about God from the world that he could see. This is a psalm for modern man as much as ancient man. It tells that there is more to reality than mere matter, which is ultimately doomed to pass away. God is. He holds reality together. Unlike imaginary gods of of myth that are long forgotten, He is forever. Four times in the psalm we read this word forever. It, It ends, His praise endures forever. He is pure, He is wise, He is powerful, He is eternal. So it follows that He's the one we should trust in. He's the one to be feared. That, as the psalmist reminds us in verse 10, is the beginning of wisdom. He feared the Lord. And because he did, he rejoiced in the Lord. The psalm begins with an outburst of worship. Hallelujah is the the first word of Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. It's a genuine, emotional outburst of adoration, devotion, and celebration. It's all contained within a carefully constructed psalm arranged in what is known as an acrostic. And what that means is the first word of each line after hallelujah begins with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In English, it would, be, it would begin with a word that starts with A, and then the next line with a word that begins with B, and then the next line with a word that begins with C, and so on through the alphabet. And probably that was done to facilitate memorization, which in the case of this psalmist would suggest that these things that he wrote about, he believed were very important and needed to be put to memory. But we lose the acrostic in translation. It doesn't help us. But it does indicate the great, the great care the psalmist put into composing this, this song or poem, this psalm. The cause of his praise, his, his hallelujah, is the works of God which encompass the works of God in creation, the works of God in His providence, and the works of God in His grace, His salvation. His thoughts move from the material to the spiritual, from the universe to the exodus. And again, it gives enthusiasm to His praise of the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. That's how praise ought to be given to the Lord. With all our heart, full-throated, not half-hearted, with our minds only, with our minds fully engaged, our intellect and our understanding, our wills and emotion, all of it fully engaged. But to be able to do that We must think on the right things and think about them correctly. Only a person with a new heart, a regenerated soul, only the born again can do that. And it's among the born again that the psalmist wants to praise the Lord and express his thankfulness to the Lord among the community or the the council and assembly of the righteous. We have a need to express our love for the Lord publicly, in public worship. That's as true in the church today as it was in ancient Israel. But we can't do that with unbelievers. Our praise is foolishness to them. And so the psalmist longed to be among friends. He longed to be among like-minded people and engage in worship with them, praising God with the people of God. That's fellowship. 
But genuine worship and thanksgiving begins in the heart. It, it, it is personal. Public worship encourages worship. It's necessary. But worship with all my heart is first of all individual. It is personal. And when it is, then we will proclaim the Lord among the unregenerate, among the unbelieving. We won't do it indiscriminately. We'll do it wisely, not mechanically. But when the opportunity is right, our hearts will be prepared to give the truth of God to those around us and live it. With all my heart speaks of of deep conviction and gratitude that the psalmist had. So how do we have that? That's uh, the, the, the wellspring of worship. How do we get that? How do we generate in, in our whole soul this desire to worship and praise the Lord? It's by studying the things of God. That's what the psalmist did. And, and what all who do who worship the Lord. Verse 2. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. The works here are God's works of creation. It, it, is, in the, um, it is in reference to, to those works that, that, this world, that this word works is generally used. What God has made. For example, in Psalm 8, verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? As David looked at the world, the the beauty of nature, the variety and complexity and the order of the natural world, and especially uh, the magnificent display of God's creation in the the night sky. He marveled. He marveled at all of that and and marveled that God had made man the crown of His creation in light of it. It's the same in Psalm 19 that begins, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. There it's the work of His hands. There we see it again. As a shepherd boy, David spent a lot of time looking at the sky at night, studying the moon and the stars, and and he didn't miss the meaning of it. That it declared the glory of God. And that naturally led to worship. And without the aid of modern science, he did that. We know so much more today that is not revealed to the naked eye. The vastness of space, the, the, uh, the number of the stars and galaxies. It produces wonder in all who consider it. The, that wonder should produce in those who study these things and who observe these things, it should produce worship and should... Uh, as should a, I should say, as a, should a, a consideration of man himself, who seems so small and insignificant in the greater scheme of things, as suggested in Psalm 8. But man is a marvel, created from dust, but in the image of God. That image has been wrecked by the fall. But still, there is a glimmer of it, a very clear glimmer of it. And the human body is a a, a universe in and of itself made up of 30 trillion cells. It's amazing. Almost like our national debt. (laughs) And those cells all function and work together in harmony with each other. They're full of life. Infused with life. And, and then that raises the question, well, what is life? How did it come to be? What is the soul, the immaterial part of our being? Man, science, apart from divine revelation, by human reason alone, has never been able to answer those questions. 
Evolution can't explain how or why it all began, how something came out of nothing. All of science from astronomy to biology and every other discipline points to the Creator. It's called natural revelation, general revelation again. But mankind, both ancient and modern, has refused to believe it. And for a reason. Paul explained that in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Men suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. The heavens declare God's existence. Man himself and herself declares it. Every time we look into the mirror, we see the evidence of God, the Creator, staring back at us. His image. It is evident in the universe around us and within us, every soul of us, Paul said. Evident, yet men deny it. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness, push it down so that they won't have to submit to the God they have rebelled against. Instead, man found a substitute for the Creator in the creation and worshipped it as God. Four-footed things, creeping things, and he has, is still doing that to this very day. In different ways with different gods, man worships what he values most. It may be money, it may be pleasure, it may be fame, it may be any number of things. Mankind is very religious, but his religion is completely irreligious and self-serving. The psalmist didn't deal with that explicitly, directly here, the fall of man and and human rebellion, but it lies behind his statements. The natural man, man in unbelief, can never say hallelujah. And the only reason the psalmist could, and the righteous in Israel could, is because of God's grace, which is the greatest reason to praise the Lord. And he will come to that in this psalm. But here at the beginning, he speaks of of things generally, of the wonders of creation. And they are many. He wrote that they are studied by those who delight in them. The only way we will understand God's works is if we study them. That takes effort. And actually, the, the word translated study is the word seek. It also means to examine. So seeking the truth is an essential part of the life of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, in that great chapter of faith, states that God is the rewarder of those who seek Him. One of the commentators wrote, mental indolence or laziness, mental indolence, Indolence never yet led to spiritual illumination. To see much of God's glory, we must sweat our brains, he said. In other words, make every effort. The psalmist was encouraging that. To seek, to examine, to study the great works of God. Splendid and and majestic is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. Now here it's a different word for His work. It is often uh, used of, of deeds or actions, and it is more likely His work of providence. Moses used this word for God's work in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect. Then he describes his work as all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Clearly, here, Moses was describing God's works of providence. 
how He sustains and governs His creatures and creation and all their actions. He is the rock. He is the foundation uh, of all existence and of our lives. He's firm, unchanging, but always active and always reliable. Moses was praising the Lord's character as revealed in his deeds, and the psalmist was too. His deeds are splendid. They are majestic and righteous. God's government, His providence is righteous. What can be more splendid and majestic than His act of creation? He spoke everything into existence, and time began. When it was in a prehistoric state of chaos, and the earth was covered in water and darkness, lifeless, he said, let there be light, and there was light. That's splendid. And such works continue as he regularly, faithfully provides and blesses the world daily, moment by moment, always. That's the promise of Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. They always continue. That's providence. The way the Lord makes the world function. And He is true to His Word. He is always faithful and dependable. As the psalmist said, His righteousness endures forever. That's the first of four times He says forever. God will never cease to be faithful to His promises to the world generally and to His people particularly. Men take it for granted. Seed time and harvest, they expect it without a thought. Without a thought given to God who is the cause of it and makes it all happen. Well, Jeremiah gave thought to it and and praise to God for it, even though the natural man takes it for granted. He praised the Lord in in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindnesses, he wrote, indeed never cease. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's faithful to all mankind in the natural realm, to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. That is what we call common grace. But in verse 4, the psalmist's thoughts move to the Lord's saving acts. He mentions the Lord's grace and compassion here in regard to the Passover, the celebration of the Lord's deliverance of Israel from slavery, and, and all of the events that surrounded that great event. Verses 4 through 9 suggests that the reference suggests that with reference to the feeding of the people, giving them the nations as their inheritance, and redeeming them. Saving them out of a dire condition. But also in verse 4, the psalmist refers to God's wonders being remembered. Remembering is a, a very important aspect of Passover and reinforces that reinforces that as as being the subject here. In Exodus 13, verse 3, Moses told Israel, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery. They were to remember it all of their life and they were to celebrate it annually to keep that in their minds and to keep them remembering it. So he wrote in verse 4, He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. What wonders? Powerful saving wonders is what he's referring to. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord said, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders. It is the same word here. 
And it refers to the ten plagues of Egypt, his judgments on that land. They were miracles of great power from turning the Nile to blood and covering the land in darkness to slaying the firstborn at midnight from the house of the king to that of the slave. God said each plague was a judgment on the gods of Egypt to show that they were nothing and that He alone is God maker of heaven and earth, and judge of all mankind. But they were also saving wonders seen in the mighty hand that brought Israel out of bondage and into freedom. That's what the psalm celebrates, and, and that is what should be remembered. He is gracious and compassionate. In verse 5, the psalmist gives examples of that in the Lord's care for His people Israel. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. What covenant is that? Well, it's the covenant that He remembered in Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, when He heard the groanings of His people in Egypt. Then God remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That Abrahamic covenant is in Genesis 15, 13 through 21, when God promised to multiply Abraham's offspring like the stars of the sky and to give them the land of Canaan. It, it, it's not like the conditional covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. In Genesis 15, you'll remember, the Lord alone passed between the sacrificed pieces of the animals to guarantee that He would keep the promise to Abraham. Abraham was not invited to pass through those sacrificed animals. Only God passed through them, showing that it's an unconditional covenant. And forever... The psalmist wrote that very fact is what he's saying here. God is faithful to His Word always, forever. His promises never fail. And based on that covenant, that unconditional covenant, the psalmist said in verse 6, He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The power of His works were made known to them in plagues on Egypt that brought them out of their slavery and their works of providence. The works of providence He performed that brought them into Canaan and their inheritance. He, and His faithfulness is seen in, in other ways, in his, the provision that He made for His people as they wandered through the wilderness in between the exodus and the entrance. That's verse 5. He has given food to those who fear Him. Every day He fed them manna from heaven, supernatural food, in fact, in Psalm 78, it's called angel's food. Exquisite food. Heavenly bread. God was magnificently faithful to His people daily. Derek Kidner wrote, the Lord was, uh, wrote of the Lord's daily forbearance. Because you remember, the people received all that they needed, and yet what did they do? They grumbled and they complained all through that wilderness wandering. Nevertheless, He continued to provide for them and protect them daily. Christian, do you think He will not take care of you in the times of wilderness that you pass through? Of course He will. Of course He will. That is His character. It's exhibited in all of His works and words. His precepts according to, to verses 7 and 8. Not just His works that are to be marveled at, but His words, His promises. He spoke. He gave Israel His law on Mount Sinai. 
It is truth and righteousness. The gods of Egypt and Greece, the gods of the, of the Gentiles, didn't speak. They were dumb idols that Isaiah described as a block of wood from which a man kindles a fire to warm himself, and then with the other part of the wood he fashions a god. Then the man says, deliver me, for you are my god. But it can't deliver him or anyone because it's just a block of wood. Nothing more. It can't see. It can't talk. It can't walk. It can't save. So it is with all false gods, whether it's the gods of the Hindu, the god of the Muslim, or the possessions of the modern materialist. They can't give light, truth, counsel. They can't give help. They can't deliver because they are nothing but a fantasy or lifeless stuff. The imaginations of darkened minds. Only the Lord God of Scripture saves the triune God. And that's how the psalmist describes Him in verse 9, as the one who saves, who sent redemption to His people. Redemption summarizes God's action in the Exodus, in the wanderings, and in the conquest. And His faithfulness to keep His promises to Abraham was demonstrated in the most awesome way at the Red Sea when, when he brought Israel safely through and drowned Egypt in it. That was power and justice and deliverance. Redemption. Based on the shedding of the blood of the Passover lambs. At the end of that, on the other side of the sea, in, the Exodus, in Exodus chapter 15, Moses led Israel in a song of praise. The, the song of Moses. And he proclaimed, this is my God and I will extol him. That's what the psalmist is doing here in Psalm 111. He is saying, this is my God. Great are the works of the Lord. Those works are real. Not like the, the, the mythical deeds of Homer's gods and heroes. The Lord is the God of history. Ancient history, modern history, the God of today. He is forever. Why does the psalmist repeat that word? His righteousness endures forever. His praise endures forever. Because He is forever. He is the eternal God. He is unique. He is holy. He is, he is set apart. When a, a Greek child asked his or her father, who made Zeus? Their father would answer, Kronos. Well, who made Kronos? Uranus. Well, who made Uranus? And so it went, an absurd, an absurd infinite regression. But today when a child asks, who made God? Our answer is, God didn't need to be made. He's always been. He's eternal, without beginning and without end. He has life in Himself. He is self-existent, self-sufficient. He doesn't need us. He needs nothing. He's endless, bound by nothing but His own will and righteousness, which is perfect. Everything depends on Him. Nothing is too difficult for Him. His works, all of them, works of creation and providence are wonders. And He's still doing great works. He does today what He did then, but even greater. God's redemption of Israel at the Red Sea is seen in the New Testament as a picture, a type of our redemption by Christ at Calvary. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul calls Christ our Passover. The lambs slain that night in Egypt 
whose blood was applied to the Israelite doors predicted Christ on the cross and what he accomplished for us. He brought us out of slavery to sin and death and the devil. And we are to remember that regularly in the Lord's Supper. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, where he quoted Jesus who said, Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord blesses us every day with life. He feeds us every day as he did in the wilderness with Israel. He gives us the energy to work. That's one of his providential ways of providing for us. He gives us the discipline, the energy to do work, and so we're able to work and provide for ourselves. And when that energy fails, He has miraculous ways of providing. His providence makes provision and blessing in our lives daily. He has given us immortality and will bring us into the heavenly Canaan someday. He won't fail. He can't fail. He is our God. Almighty full of grace and compassion for His people, unconditionally bound to us. As that covenant in Genesis 15 illustrates and demonstrates. He is unconditionally bound to His people forever. We can trust Him fully. We can trust Him completely. That's the wise life that the counsel of the psalmist gives as he closes out this psalm of praise. This is his counsel. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Fear to us is normally associated with terror and the instinct to, to flee, to run from danger. And the author of Hebrews does say it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But he also said, we are not of those who shrink back. We have faith. And here, for the believer, fear is reverence. It is believing and, and, and produces love for Him and obedience. It, it's a sober life. It's a serious life. The fear of the Lord is. But that is the beginning of wisdom. So, do you want to know reality? Do you want to have an understanding of, of, of what this world really is and know how to live in it so that your life has order and peace and, and counts for all eternity? Well, that's what wisdom gives us. And, the only, and it only comes to us and to those who trust in the Lord and follow His lead and His Word, follow His revelation. It's given to those who seek it, those who study it, they find it. So may we follow the psalmist's counsel and live our life to the Lord and His Word and follow it faithfully. Well, if you have not done that, if you're here in unbelief. All of this means very little to you. In fact, it may very well have been a, a rather boring hour for you. But if that's so, you're like Homer and those ancient Greeks. Your mind is darkened. At least they understood there is more to this world and life than is seen. And there is. There is the Lord God. He's not like those foolish gods they believed in. Uh, as the author of Hebrews wrote, there is no cre creature hidden 
from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare. They laid bare to, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But don't fall into his hands in unbelief. He knows everything. Everything about you. Everything about your thoughts, your deeds. More about you than you possibly know about yourself. And someday we all have to meet Him. It's with Him that we have to do. It's with Him we deal with. Don't fall into His hands in unbelief. He is gracious. He is compassionate. He receives all who trust in Christ, His eternal Son. Believe and receive from Him the free gift of eternal life. And then join in the psalmist's worship, the psalmist's worship of Him and praise His works and His great work of saving your soul. Well, let's stand and sing number 105 in the Red Book. Another hymn of great praise. Holy, holy, holy. Psalm 105, uh, hymn 105. Father, we do praise you as holy. We praise the triune God as holy and faithful and merciful. We see that in the works of your hands. We see that in the promises you've made in Scripture. And we thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy, which has brought us into your, a relationship with you through the shed blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him to die for us, to make us your people, and to be so faithful to us. May we be faithful to you, be obedient to you, to follow you and in, in your instruction in a way that brings glory to you and blessing to those around us. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you shalom, peace. In Christ's name, amen.